Hi, everyone. We have had such a great day one of our conference, and it is going to continue to the next two last two sessions. Um, we have amazing presenters, so um, stick with us. And tomorrow we have a full day of great presenters again. Today we have with us Cindy Terrybush. She is an early childhood consultant and the author of Teach the Whole Preschooler, Strategies for Nurturing Developing Minds. She is the co-host of the podcast, How Preschool Teachers Do It. Super cool. I'm going to have to listen to that. Cindy has worked with young children for more than 20 years. She has experienced teaching and directing in childcare, preschool, and school age programs. She is a sought after educational consultant, workshop facilitator, keynote speaker, and professional development provider for ECE professionals. We are always honored when you come here and present for us. So the floor is yours and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We're here in, during this session to talk about the role of play, particularly during the times that we're living in, living in. But to get everybody sort of transitioned, you know, as someone who works in early childhood, I'm a big person on transitions. To get you transitioned, I would love for you to go in the chat and just tell me what was your favorite thing to play when you were a child? Start thinking about play. What did you enjoy? We're gonna do the awkward Zoom pause until answers start to come up. Okay, so Tisha said, at school, housekeeping center, at home, hide and seek. Hide and seek with friends. Oh, people really liked hide and seek. Swinging, wasn't swinging so much fun? You know, a lot of playgrounds today don't have the swings anymore, uh, which I think is unfortunate. Playing outdoors, outside play, yep, yeah, kick the can more swinging and housekeeping coming up, climbing trees, being creative, where you could be the teacher. My favorite thing to play when I was a child was school. I played school all the time. I have an uncle who was a teacher. He became an assistant principal, but he was a teacher when I was very young and he used to bring me like the leftover grade books. It was so fun to use those and play school. And look where I ended up. Um, freeze tag, hide and seek at home. As you're reflecting on what you love to play, I'd also like you to just think about how it made you feel. How did play make you feel when you were young? What words would you use to describe that? You can also stream those in the chat. What was the feeling you had in your body, in your soul? Freedom and peace. Mm -hmm. Oh, I used to play cooking too. I had one of the little kitchens, Sarita. Um, it's joyful. Yeah. And I'd like you to keep these words in mind as we go through the session, peaceful, free, joyful, expressive. It was fulfilling and pleasant and adventurous and fun. And I'm, I'm glad you joined me to remember what that was like when we were young. As we go through the session, I wanna invite you to park any questions you may have in the chat. I do have my chat open and hopefully we'll have time to answer the questions, but you'll have a way to contact me maybe afterward if um, we don't get a chance to do all that. Some people collect stamps and some people collect uh, coins. I collect quotes. This is one of my favorite quotes. And it says, education begins when we see children as innately wise and capable beings. Only then can we play around in their world. And they are born so capable. Their capacity for learning is amazing. If only we would think of ourselves as facilitators of their learning instead of the answer people. You don't need to instigate all the learning. When you think about your life, both as a child and as an adult, the best discoveries and the most lasting discoveries that you have likely made were self-discoveries. It's the things we discover on our own and come to understand that really can be so impactful in our lives. So we, as early education professionals, need to know when not to instigate but when to facilitate. And we'll talk more about how to facilitate it. One of the great gifts that facilitating play well gives us is that it enables us to meet each child where they are. 
to help a child build their knowledge, there are several things that we need to do. We have to start with who they are, their understandings, their interests, and build upon wherever they are today in their skill levels in development in a developmentally appropriate way. At the age that these young children are at, they are not abstract thinkers yet. So we need to understand how, how they take in information and use it and what meaningful looks like, learning looks like to them. The National Association for the Education of Young Children, otherwise known as NACI, defines developmentally appropriate practices for us. And in that definition, we can see why play is so important. NACI defines developmentally appropriate practice, like you see on the slide, as the methods that promote each child, each individual child's optimal development and learning. And it should be strength-based, play-based, and it's an approach that should be joyful and engaging. Some of the things that you've already put in the chat. So being strength-based and play-based, having a joyful and engaging environment are developmentally appropriate. And it also recognizes and supports each individual child as a valued member of our community. It had developmentally appropriate practices are culturally, linguistically and ability appropriate for every individual child. And it's really through play that we can implement that. The truth though, is that there has never been enough play in our society. We talk this year, last year, even the year before about the impact of the pandemic, but there has never been enough play. Before the pandemic, the American Academy of Pediatrics asked pediatricians not to throw away their paper prescription pads when prescriptions went digital. So I go to the doctor now and they're all on laptops or iPads and that's how they send my prescriptions. What the American Academy of Pediatrics told pediatricians to do, and again, this is before the pandemic, they told them take out your prescription pads and every time a family comes to you for a well visit, you need to prescribe play to that family. They need to know that once per day, children need to have at least one hour of creative free play and one hour of physically active play because it wasn't happening. Not only did pediatricians and the academy recognize that there wasn't enough play for young children, at the same time, laundry detergent companies, and this was an effort led by Purcell in particular, that company, realized that people were doing less laundry and they wanted to know why their sales were down. So they did some research and they found that children were spending less time playing and getting dirty so they started a campaign. The laundry detergent companies banded together and started a campaign called Free the Children, Dirt is Good. That was to both encourage more messy play and of course boost their sales. It has become, by the way now, a worldwide effort to increase playtime for children everywhere. So this initiative has grown to include all children everywhere. One of the startling statistics that came out of the work that these detergent companies did was that prisoners in a maximum security prison were on average guaranteed two hours of outdoor time per day and young children were getting less than that. Which when you think about it is startling. So this was happening before March of 2020 and then 2020 came. We understood once the pandemic started and children were no longer in programs. And by the way, I just attended a session by the National um, Institute for Early Education Research where they talked about how we have never returned to the number of children attending programs that we were in the past. Um, and because of all that separation from lockdowns and because of people not enrolling their children in programs, we understood, I think, that children were going to have a decrease in self-help skills because let's face it, when you're home with your family and listen, I'm a parent, I totally get it. Sometimes it's just simpler, especially for families who suddenly found themselves working at home 
So they were working at home and being their children's teacher and having a lot of pressure on them. It's just sometimes simpler to do things for your children. I get that. We also understood, and I had many conversations with teachers about the fact that children were gonna spend less time socializing with a wide range of people because of what was happening in the pandemic. And the studies that are taking place now show that is still happening in many different ways. The number of people that children are exposed to and spend meaningful playtime with has decreased for a variety of reasons uh, related to COVID-19. But there was also information that was rather surprising. We didn't immediately consider the impact that less meaningful playtime was gonna have on the development of children. Head Start and other stakeholders on the national level in early education started to study the differences in skills and children's milestones since the pandemic. I do, uh, as, as Dr. Shipley said, I am a consultant. I speak with teachers and teaching teams all the time. And you can chime in in the chat if this has been your experience. I am consistently being told now about the differences between the children who enter programs now and children who did before the pandemic, that there is a difference in the age at which they're reaching certain milestones. Uh, there's a difference in their communication skills, that there are all these differences. And, what the studies on the national level showed is the differences are due to a lack of playtime. And the concern at that level is that there's going to be an, just an overwhelming number of people requesting spe special education evaluation and mistaking a pandemic delay, which is related to lack of experience for a developmental delay which has to do with the child's brain development. So we have two things going on in classrooms right now. We have children experiencing pandemic delays depending on what their experience has been during this time. And we have children who have actual developmental delays. And at the same time, we have children who are typically developing. And play is how all of them take in information and practice using it. So I see in the chat, I have my chat open like I promised and I see people are putting yes, there is a difference between before and after. And folks, why wouldn't there be? When you think about brain development, our brains are shaped by our experiences. And so this generation is having very different experiences. We don't really quite know where that's gonna land, right? I have two children in their mid and late 20s. Uh, they were too young to remember life before 9-11. I remember sitting at that time saying it's, it's just so awful that my children, and I'm very close to New York. I'm in New Jersey, very close to New York. Um, and, and we just kept saying it's just so awful that our children aren't going to feel as safe as we did in this environment, that they won't know that you could. We went to airports and we walked to the gate and we said goodbye to people at the gate and we could freely walk most places. And, you know, we were sad that our children wouldn't know that. They grew up anyway. They didn't know any better. They didn't know differently. And we don't know how this generation is going to land. But I do tell you this. This for sure I know. And, and Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers taught us this. He taught that play gives children a chance to practice what they're learning. They have to play with what they know to be true in order to find out more. And then they can use what they learn in new forms of play. They have to be playing. The lack of play during the pandemic is being identified as the biggest obstacle to skill development and skill levels. And I see there's still agreement in the chat about the differences and here folks is one of the biggest obstacles. You and I cannot control what people do at home, but I certainly can control what happens in my early childhood program. Uh, go back into the chat for me. I want to ask you a question. If I asked you to submit one word to describe young children, what word would you use? Go ahead and start streaming them in the chat. One word that you would describe young children with. So Kenzie said carefree, vibrant, curious, 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 curious keeps coming up. Yeah, they are very curious. They're uninhibited and so often uninhibited. Adventurous, curious, blessings. They can be resilient when we support them 
in ways that they need. They're active, they're free, they're playful. I'll tell you some of my words for young children. When people ask me to describe young children, young children are inventors, innovators. Uh, Jesse just said they are little scientists. We need to value children's play as the practice that it is. They need the time and the space to freely explore, try, make mistakes, make decisions, and practice the skills we're introducing to them. And it doesn't matter where in your space they do that, but it matters how we facilitate it. Always keep in mind, and keep in mind through the rest of this session, this discussion focuses on the larger goal, the skill building. In early education and education as a whole, frankly, it's really not about the individual task. It's about the building of knowledge and understandings and skills. It's about scaffolding for the children. And through play and good conversations, we can do that. Scaffolding is one of those jargony buzzwords that I always like to define for people. Scaffolding means the child comes to you with a base of knowledge, and that's true from infancy. They come with their experiences, their knowledge. And we are going to basically build a scaffold and help them and support them while they add to their knowledge. Children have some early childhood development struggles when they're young. And that's because the prefrontal cortex of the brain where executive function skills like working memory, impulse control, the ability to filter demands and priorities, reasoning, problem solving, that's all governed in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is right behind your forehead. During the first three years of life, development is happening very quickly, but the prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead lags behind the development of the rest of the brain. The delay in development in that area is called cognition without control. So the children have understandings, but have trouble with self-regulation. Thinking and understanding without self-regulation and the lack of impulse control really impacts the children. And this can even be more exaggerated with a lack of play. People think the opposite. People think, oh, if we are controlling the environment all the time, then the children will be able to control themselves well, but that's not true. Because play helps to teach children what you see on the slide. We build the brain through experiences. We need to lay the foundation for that prefrontal cortex, which by the way, is not fully developed until children are in their late twenties or early thirties. So I'm not sure what we're always expecting of children who are birth to five years old, for example. What are we expecting? Even kindergarten through third grade, you know, early childhood is birth through age eight. That part of the brain isn't fully developed at, at that time at all. We're still laying the foundation. And if we're going to agree that experiences sculpt the architecture of the brain, we have to provide children with experiences that help them to learn certain skills governed in that area, which include self-regulation. That's the ability to cope with your emotions and make behavioral decisions. Decision-making overall, social interaction and critical thinking skills. All of that is toned as they play. I often teach um, not only college classes, also CDA credential students, teachers who are working in the field when I provide professional development. A lot of my work over the past several years has been about teaching people how to facilitate free play time. Some people call it free choice time. The information before the pandemic about how long a free choice time is, uh, kind of frightened some people, but free play time is very intentional. Before the pandemic, the advice and the information provided to us by high quality curriculums, by research, by tools used to rate programs for quality rating systems was that children need at least 60 uninterrupted minutes of play, uninterrupted. That means I'm not calling them to over to a table to do something with me. I'm not going to pull them over to create something with me. They get 60 uninterrupted minutes. And you may be wondering why 60 uninterrupted minutes. 
It's because the current research shows that human beings don't get deeply into what they're doing and deeply think about what they're playing for at least 40 to 45 minutes. And you know what? I know that to be true. Um, I am a jigsaw puzzler. I love doing jigsaw puzzles. When I first sit down at my puzzle, I know what's happening on the TV show in front of me, and I know that my husband's talking to me. About 40 minutes later, I realize I missed what was happening between the commercials, and poor Todd is talking to me, and I have no idea what he's saying. 40 to 45 minutes to really deeply think about what we're doing, and we need children to deeply think about what they're doing. While they are there playing, I told you I'm not calling them over to me. Instead, I am going to them, and I am looking for teachable moments. I'm also taking observation notes about what they're doing so that I have a full understanding or a fuller understanding of their abilities. Children actually exhibit the upper limits of their abilities when they're being creative and when they have the freedom to do that. So as they are creating things with the blocks, as they are in another part of the room, creating a whole story and narrative over in the dramatic play area. And they're over um, at the art area and they're creating things there. And I haven't told them what to make. This is free choice time. They get to decide what to make. While they're doing all that, I'm gonna take notes about what they're doing to figure out what their skill level is. I'm also gonna do what you see on the slide. I'm gonna ask them open-ended questions, questions that don't have one right answer. I'm gonna ask them why they've done something. I'm gonna ask them maybe their favorite part about something. I'm gonna ask them how it's used. One of my favorite dramatic play questions when I go to the dramatic play area is to ask them what's the story they're playing. So many adults go over and just sort of take it over. An adult, an adult will see them playing restaurant and then sit down and say, I would like some chicken nugget, nuggets, please. Well, what if this was not McDonald's? What if this was a pizzeria? We have to ask the children about what they're thinking and creating. And it helps them to think more deeply about it when we ask open-ended questions. We should add vocabulary to what we're doing. We tend to use a very small vocabulary with children. We need to widen that. I'm going to use bigger words with children. I, I was working in a classroom um, and a group of children were building these really tall structures. And I asked them, what happens in those things you're building? What happens with those? And one of the children told me these are the big, big buildings that where are where his father works. And I said, did you know that those big, big buildings are called skyscrapers? Why do you think they're called skyscrapers? And we had a cold conversation about it. And from that day forward, the children who were building tall things kept calling them skyscrapers. So they kept using the vocabulary. We need to help children build on their ideas by asking good questions. And we will get there in this session uh, and help children by guiding their social emotional development, by teaching them coping and decision making skills, while they're playing, while they're doing that socialization. And again, that socialization that isn't often happening outside our settings anymore. Free choice time for 60 uninterrupted minutes, as I said, kind of scares people, but it's not a free for all. All freedom includes some boundaries. Think about we here in the United States are in what we call a free country, but we have laws, we have things to abide by. So I get to make a lot of decisions in my life while I'm following some basic rules and the rules and laws we have are intended to keep people safe. It's the same in a classroom. I need to decide what rules do I need to teach the children to keep people safe? One of the rules that we tend to teach children to keep them safe is how many people can fit in each area of the classroom. And we're gonna call those areas interest areas. That phrase comes from the creative curriculum. I love that phrase because it is universally used in the same way. Just so you know, centers is not. As somebody who travels from program to program, I can tell you that centers from program to program, that word is used differently. And it's even used differently from classroom to classroom. I will go in one classroom. It'll be actually a small group time where children are in small groups working with the adults. And I'll say, what time of day is this? And they say, oh, it's centers. And I go next door and it's free play time. And I say, what time of day is this? And they say, it centers. So we're gonna call this interest areas because that's what it is. These are areas in your classroom that have only the things that belong in that area. And those things are of interest to the children. 
you can decide how many children fit over there. And you can see these are some pictures where I, that I took at my consulting clients where they have systems. These children that you're looking at right now are in pre-K. This was their system. Uh, for children who are younger, you would have the children's pictures on clothespins maybe or pictures with their name. And a lot of people I know do this. A lot of people have these visuals and you do need visuals. They have the visuals for how many children fit, but here's something they don't do and don't often know in my experience. If you're going to do that, in order to teach children self-regulation, you have to have a waiting list. So you can see clearly see in the picture on the right, let me see if I can make that bigger for you. There's a waiting list here. There is a waiting list. And I was in the classroom the day that Valentina used this. This was a mixed group of three and four-year-olds. They had learned what the late waiting list meant. It took us some support from the teachers in the big, particularly in the beginning of the school year, but they learned what to do. Everybody has two things with their name on it, whatever symbols you use or whatever pictures you use, two of them, please. One is for where I'm gonna play right now, and the other is for the waiting list. So when I was in this room, Valentina walked over to the dramatic play area where she really wanted to play. She saw that it was full. She knew she had to go over and get her name tag for the waiting list. She went and she got it. She put it on the waiting list and she went right next door to the next interest area. She went to the blocks. I will share with you that she spent almost the entire time in the blocks looking over to the dramatic play area to see if everybody was still there, but she self-regulated. She did not get upset. She did not um, cry and get upset like the teachers told me children had in the past. She was more patient than they had experienced with children in the past, as was the case for all the children in this class. So she put her name there. And I'm gonna tell you another little piece of magic about this. If you make the waiting list movable and you have it on Velcro or something and you take it and you bring it over to the children in that dramatic play area and you say to them, hey, everybody, look, Valentina's waiting to come over here. Would anyone like to give her a turn? because those children have a visual, they actually are more apt to volunteer to leave the area so that they also are making a choice. And I see people putting in the chat, this is an amazing idea. I wish I could fully take credit for it, but I can't. The early childhood environmental rating scales, the third revision of it, the third edition, in the clarification notes that people in our society have been conditioned not to read, actually says you need a waiting list. Um, helping people to implement it is work I've done, helping them to design it with things like the yield signs you see here is work I've done. But the idea actually comes from Eckers, the Early Childhood Environmental Rating Scale. Um, so Andrea said, even the process of walking to get her waiting list is helping self-regulation. Correct. If she gets upset later, uh, so be it. Children have a limited ability to wait. We know that but it was self-regulation to do that. And yes, Michelle, you can apply this at home. Visuals, children need visuals, but you know what? So do you. So let me get your reaction to this. I always like to relate these concepts to a life we can relate to. So here's what I realized during this pandemic. I, I told you I live in New Jersey. There was a point at which uh, people who wanted vaccines for COVID-19 were told to sign up on a state waiting list, on a state list, basically. And people went onto their computers and they signed up for this list and then heard nothing, absolutely nothing. Nothing was happening. Nobody was getting appointments to go get their vaccines. And people started to wonder, did I do it correctly? Do people know I'm waiting? At the same time as people started to get nervous about that, my state put out an 800 number for people who don't have access to the internet to sign up for their vaccines through the 800 number. But what people were doing was flooding the 800 number with questions like, do you know I'm on the waiting list? Can you check your computer? So what New Jersey had to do was send out frequent text messages and emails after that to people on the waiting list saying, basically, we know you're waiting. Please stop calling the 800 number. So if adults need that sort of reassurance, why, would child, why wouldn't children? So Callie put in the chat, um, they use the visual timer for transition times and kids love it and so does she. I highly recommend, look, I even have one on my desk. This is how much I love them. Highly recommend a stand timer. 
because children understand that passage then a little bit better. And Callie, I saw your remark earlier about my podcast. Thank you. Just gonna put that in there. Um, so waiting lists. And the one on the left, they also have a yield sign down at the bottom. I really liked the one on the right because not only, not only did they put a yield sign, but on the bottom, I don't know how well you can see it. This person on the bottom right is actually showing them how to say wait in sign language. So I thought that that was a terrific idea that came from the teacher. Um, and you're right, Tori, restaurants are now texting us our place in line as we wait. Why wouldn't children need this? We need it. There's so many things like that. You know, we expect children to wait. We don't like to wait. We look for the shortest line everywhere. So we have to be realistic about our expectations. And I think this is part of being realistic. In developmentally appropriate prior environments, children are exploring real life items. We bring real life items in, plants, real things like real boxes from their cereal, real things for the science or discovery area. Children need to explore the real world around them through their senses. There are things that they use and are exposed to all the time that they're so curious about. And they express their curiosity by experimenting and exploring through their senses. So we need to put these things in front of them to understand what it is they're curious about. One of the real things to bring into a classroom for children to interact with is environmental print. Environmental print are the logos and the street signs that children see in their real world all the time. And why do we want to do that? Because we are always meeting children where they are. And folks, this is where this class was. Children recognized these on site. And so the teacher created for free choice time, uh, interactive, the children could choose to use it, an interactive word wall where they could pick out logos and their classmates' names and their names and put it on the word wall by matching the first letter. Children loved this. They loved it because they recognized the words. They were so excited when they found the ones they loved. She told me that that she had a basket where all these words were. This is all Velcro. I think you can see some of the Velcro. And she had a basket and the children would go digging in the basket for the words they were looking for. Such a really great skill. And through environmental print, we can teach children shapes, colors, letters, numbers in the order in which we now know children learn this best. When we were young, or at least when I was young, we went from letters to words. They said to us, this is the letter B. It sounds like Buh. We all did a lot of buh, 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 buh. We wrote B over and over and over again. And then they said to us, and by the way, you know, B is in words. Let's talk about what words it's in. When we say to children, what's this word? And they recognize it. I've captured their interest. They're excited to have the conversation and they see the function of letters. So instead of going from letters to words, we want to go from words to letters and we can give them free play opportunities to explore it. Think about the logos and things they see in your neighborhood, all the things they would recognize on site. It's amazing, by the way. I've had parents tell me my child knows the McDonald's logo and has never eaten McDonald's. It's just part of the world. Children know the Amazon logo. They know Target. Uh, I've seen many teachers take the Target circles, you know, the red and white circles, and just write the word Target underneath. Uh, I work with a teacher who showed the children the postal service logo. And I said to her, they won't know that. And she said, no, they will. She showed it to them and they said, that's the mail. So she wrote mail underneath. Whatever they say for the ones that are just symbols, you write it underneath. So I encourage you to have interactive literacy things for them to just explore during free play time. Children need time to apply information in useful ways. And they can use the information that they're growing to understand. That is way more impactful than any memorization you may try to do with them. Here's an example. In traditional slash becoming more and more outdated every day, large group gatherings, 
people may be very attached to their calendar for teaching children to count, but really, if I wanna teach children how to count, we need to be counting objects. That's what we need to be counting. Counting should take place in your manipulatives area. It can, you can do small group activities where you plan counting activities. They can then explore and do that on their own during free choice time. And we can have numbers written on cards over there to match what they're counting. Similarly in dramatic play, they are over there learning about the world and applying the things that they see. Why do they love to pretend to be you and their families? Because they're trying to apply their observations of what it must be like to be so smart and powerful to their own lives. Always application is where we're aiming. Harvard Graduate School of Education teaches that all learning is unbounded. Every domain and content area builds on the others and it's all interconnected. And if we have good conversations with children, then we can help to connect all the skills that they may need to learn. When a child plays with one item, they are practicing all skills. I will give you an example. You know how children go over to the block area and they love it over there and they wanna go every single day and adults stand around saying, gosh, I gotta get that child out of the block area. No, you don't. What you need to do is push in a little bit and give them the means to practice all the different skills that they need to practice. So while they're in blocks, they're using gross and fine motor skills, or at least gross motor skills to begin with, fine motor to grab whatever they need for what they're building. You can bring paper over there and help them make signs to put on what they're building. That's literacy. You can count and measure what they're building. That's math. You can help them to negotiate the play while they're around other children. That's social emotional. Cognitive are the decision making skills and the evaluative skills that they're using to build what they're building in addition to the math and literacy. Language is developing if I go over and have conversations with them with the open ended questions and add vocabulary. So we've done that. We've done all the domains that you see on the left on this slide. We talked about literacy. We talked about math. Building with blocks is science. It's physics. Um, social studies. Social studies is, is different than social emotional skills. Social studies is more learning about their community, which again are conversations that we can add to the block area. We can put pictures over there that inspire that kind of thinking as they're building. Um, the arts include all the creative arts. They can create things on their own that they think of for that area. It's really us as facilitators that makes the difference. So no matter where the children are playing in the space, they can build their knowledge and I can help them to build their knowledge. And to do that, folks, you need to help them to make thinking visible. And that's a newer phrase that a lot of people are not familiar with. When we make thinking visible and we help them to connect multiple domains, we set up a routine with them related to how they should think about what they're doing and express things about what they're doing. So I wanna set up a routine with them about how we think about our actions. In the early childhood years, a recommended thinking routine is, I see, I think, I wonder. That's conversation that I wanna have with children. I see, I think, I wonder. I might go over to the children and say, I see, to demonstrate this, I see you're building a tall structure. I think it's really, really high. I wonder how many more blocks you can put on. And then you look at the children and say, what do you see, think, and wonder? Eventually, they'll do it without you. You have to demonstrate it in the beginning, but you'll be amazed how quickly you will hear children around the room saying, I see, and saying what they see. I think and saying what they think and I wonder and posing a question. And when they express their curiosity that way, you can better teach them because now I know what's captured their curiosity and I can set up the experiments and explorations to help them find answers to their own questions. I said earlier in the session, you are not the answer people anymore. I release you, I free you from having to know every answer. Instead, what we're gonna do is help children find answers to their own questions. I was in a classroom 
they were using the creative curriculum. They happened to have the creative curriculum as their curriculum. And they were doing the tree study that comes with the creative curriculum. So they were studying trees. And the teacher on about day five of this study says to the children, after five days of interacting with tree parts and the trees outside and reading about trees and talking about trees, though topics don't have to be every activity in the day, the teacher said to the children, what do you want to know about trees? And they asked amazing questions. One question was, and this again, this was, these were children rising three. So they were like th between three and a half and four at that point of the year. They wanted to know, do acorns fall off trees at night? There's something I would have never thought to help a child figure out. Um, they wanted to know those sorts of questions that, um, again, as an adult, I would have never thought to introduce that. And what that teacher did was she set up experiments to show them that when it's darker in a space, things can still fall down. She set up a fan to show them that when there's wind, things can still fall down, regardless if it's darker or lighter. They did a lot of experiments based on that. I want you to think about children that you work with. I see, I think, I wonder, right? That, so that could be very useful for them, but not only now, also in the future. So let's go in the chat again. And I would love for you to share with me when you think this way as an adult, when do you notice that seeing? When do you notice something, think more deeply about it, and then wonder about it? What makes you wonder? And while we do the awkward Zoom chat, I'm just going to take a sip of water. I mean, the awkward Zoom pause while you chat. Um, what do you see, think, and wonder about? So Jesse said, watching TV. She's always pulling out her phone to research. Me too. Okay. So I sit and I actually ask, I can't say it right now because I have one in here and she'll start talking, but I'll be watching TV and start, and start like, asking how old actors are, um, how old is this? Yes, Jesse, I think we fully relate to that. Michelle said, watching children makes you see, think, and wonder. Tisha wants to know, Dr. Shilby wants to know, how much do they make? Who are they married to? I look all that stuff up too. Any observation I make. Yep. Yeah. I was sitting today eating my lunch. I have two parakeets who I love to watch. They really make me see, think, and wonder. And I have available to them drinking water and water in a little thing that looks like a bathtub. And one of the parakeets decided instead to bathe in the drinking water. I see, I think, I wonder. Um, Kenzie said when she reads books and sees words that aren't familiar, mm -hmm, I see a word I don't know. I think it would help me to know it. I wonder what it means. Systems and societal ways of doing things, Yes, I wonder how it all came about sometimes, frankly, Tori. And architectural design, yep. When you, you travel or used to travel, hopefully Barbara will get back to traveling uh, more frequently anyway and further. And then, yes, Tisha asks Siri, I ask another gadget that I actually is sitting on my desk and so I can't say it or we're all gonna hear it. Um, Nancy said, when she's a passenger in the car and just looking out the window, you wonder about everything going on. Mm -hmm reading a book or watching a movie about true events. Okay, whenever I watch something that says this is based on true events, I always look and research because I wonder how much of it is true. Right? How much of it really happened? You use these skills all the time. We need to build them in young children. And here's a reason why we need to very, very carefully build these skills, folks. The world they are going to be entering is far more based on invention and innovation than the world I entered when I was a younger person. I entered uh, a world where it was sort of more, I don't know, factory style. But now think of all the event inventions that have taken place just in your lifetime. This is how children need to think. And it's really only through play that we can support this. We're gonna facilitate those meaningful conversations and then we go to them and help them to develop the cognitive skills like problem solving, decision making, evaluating, predicting, and attending to tasks.
And we have to provide them with psychologically safe environments to do this. And in a psychologically safe environment, children know it's okay to make mistakes and they have helpers here. It's fine to make mistakes. You are safe here. And all that's gonna happen if a mistake happens is we're gonna decide what else we should do instead. We're also going to, no matter where the children are in a room, we're gonna be sort of pushing into the area briefly. Don't stay there forever. Drop a little notion or question and then leave and let them experiment with it. We're gonna be adding language and literacy, math, science, and the arts. And you can see in this picture, this is a pretty well set up classroom because it has its areas separated by furniture. And in each area are only the things that belong in that area. That helps children to understand the place in which we are asking them to play. So yes, Sarita, the study of people is amazing. I sort of wish that I also had a degree in psychology, though I've taken many courses in it. But the study of people is truly amazing. And the study of young children, um, I'm, I'm like a, a total nerd for that. I love to learn about how children think, as you can see from this session. I thank all of you who are putting in the session that this was amazing. And I really want to invite you to keep learning with me. So I'm going to share a slide with you that shows you how. I co-host a podcast. Here it is over on the right. Podcasts are free, folks. Um, it's called How Preschool Teachers Do It. Uh, you're welcome to go on any podcast provider. You will find us. Just search How Preschool Teachers Do It. I co-host with my colleague, Allison Kentos. And starting with the pandemic forward, we're also on YouTube. But before the pandemic, we were listen only. Um, so you may want to find it there. You'll find it anywhere podcasts are, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, Audible. Uh, we were really approved everywhere. iTunes, Google Play, we're just honestly everywhere. Just Google how preschool teachers do it and you'll find us. We have a website where we put additional videos and, and little blog articles and all sorts of things. I also have a blog that I wrote for many years on my own on my website. You're welcome to go to my website, helpingkidsachieve.com and check out some of the things I have on there and my work on there. I have a Facebook page and I'm on Instagram. I don't even know what it's called there. I have an Instagram profile maybe um, that you can find under my full name. And I, as uh, it was said earlier, I'm the author of Teach the Whole Preschooler Strategies for Nurturing Developing Minds. And just by the way, so you know, I don't make it up. Here are my resources. There are so many resources out there. So you take the information that are in resources and you decide how will this work in a classroom with real live children. That's the task really. I hope you'll recommend the podcast. We thoroughly enjoy doing it. We're up to episode, I don't know, like 183. We release an episode every Monday morning. They're about I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes each on one topic, each having to do with young children. So please do find us. And I've come out of the sesh, the um, screen share to see if there are questions. Oh, Callie, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. I try to be a good resource and spread the love that I have for this profession and for these children. Um, you're very welcome, everybody. You're welcome. I see that all coming up in the chat. I think I've run out of time. Am I right? I could talk about this forever, by the way. Cindy, you're doing amazing. Um, you always have so much information to share. And I know that it is so valuable and so important. So you are just getting lots of kudos. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. A question came up. Do you think teachers are having a harder time facilitating play during play because of some of the direct or indirect effects the pandemic has had. So here's what I think. I think the pandemic has influenced the way that we have to approach play with young children because they have less knowledge about how to play. At the same time, all those high quality practices that we've used for years and years, we have to figure out a way that we can still implement those practices in the current environment. And I think that's the great puzzle of our time. That's what I really think. Um, I see I got a direct chat to put up information about the podcast again. I'm going to put the title of the podcast in the chat, the podcast. And again, you can just search it on Google. 
uh, how preschool teachers do 